This conference will now be recorded. All right. Um, so once again, welcome everyone. You know, just kind of want to go over a, a few things uh, as we look to get back to play. You know, we're not going to have, you know, but one opportunity to make sure we do this and do this well. Just a reminder that everything we're trying to do here is, you know, to keep our players and coaches safe. Uh, so we're going to be discussing, uh, you know, those kind of things as we go. All right. Um, the, yes, we will be putting the, uh, the session, uh, this recording up onto YouTube. So if there's anything you want to reference, you can go back and you can look at that on YouTube. Uh, also, if you would like a copy of the activities or the graphics in this, this slide deck, please give me an email and I would be happily be able to email that off to you if you like. Now, these are all just based on a lot of the ideas I've had and seen, uh, you know, for a lot of you guys that work in different coaching environments. You're, you're going to have to adjust some of these just according to your environment. Uh, but, you know, we have a certain set of things that we're going to have to kind of follow. Um, first and foremost, you know, just kind of want to go on what uh, phase two is for us. You know, phase two is our, our first step in getting back on the field. Uh, you know, that phase is going to run through uh, Monday, June 15th to Sunday, June 28th. Uh, you know, just just a couple of things on the highlight there that, that's important is that it's it's 10 players to one coach that's that's pretty clear from the governor's office that's what we need to do um so we want to keep these groups pretty small uh you know our our suggestion if you can that's 10 players to one field one coach to one field then you're gonna have to work out some operations in terms of people coming in and out uh maintain social distancing staggered start times to allow people to leave a lot of people to come in uh if you have issues in terms of can you have two, uh, two, uh, an entrance and an exit so you can kind of have traffic flow in and out, uh, particularly with our kids? You know, our kids are, are going to have a tough time when we start back just because they're going to be so excited to see their teammates, friends, that they're going to have a tough time with the social distancing. So we got to really try to help them and set them up in a, in a situation to where they can help themselves and, and stay safe there. OK, um, you know, the governor's office has been very clear, you know, six feet at all times. Uh, you know, you can go back and look at some of our stuff that we put out and some additional, uh, you know, suggestions in terms of masks, uh, you know, parking, things of those natures. Uh, we're not gonna get too much into that today because we can go on that for everything. But one of the things that, that's been pretty clear is that it's gonna be a low share environment. And, and the question now becomes, what does that mean? You know, basically what we're asking our coaches is that, you know, one kid has a set of cones that they work with. Only the coach needs to be dealing with that equipment. Uh, you know, we would we are suggesting all the kids bring their own ball. You know, if you're going to have to give balls out, you're going to have to go through and you're going to have to basically sanitize those uh, soccer balls between uses, uh, you know, so that way we don't spread the infection this way. Now, we did get good news last night that we'll be updating uh, you know, with, with everybody uh, soon and, and sending out to our technical directors, we have gotten word from Dr. Stack that we will be able to do some passing activities. Now, that will be only foot to foot. So there's not a situation where you can actually toss a ball with hands. Uh, you know, goalkeeper training is absolutely a non-starter during this moment. But we will be able to do a little bit of passing activities uh, between players, you know, as long as we uh, stay with that social distancing and, and keep everything, you know, safe for our players so bear that in mind as we start uh, going with our uh, activities here okay now one of the first things i kind of looked at is situation for us to kind of figure out how are we going to put our kids on the field you know the kids are going to need to have areas for for where their equipment needs to go they're going to have to have areas where they come in and where they come out so this is just a suggestion you know this is something i came up but you know it would be easily for us to have grass fields you know, you can, you can paint this on the field if you like. You can use cones out there to, to mark this out. Um, what would be good for any of you guys before you start playing is send out the graphic of whatever you're going to use. So that way all the parents, players have an understanding where they're supposed to go. So say, for example, for my, my son's team, maybe my, my son Dorian has been assigned number 10. Maybe my son Ken has been assigned number five. They know when they arrive and where five and ten are, so they can go straight to those points. So that way we can avoid kids congregating in one area. Now, in those little areas, and this is just a suggestion, this is my thoughts because I feel that 
because our kids are gonna have a, a tendency to want to kind of huddle together, say hi, congregate. This will be the most important time when we start is trying to kind of get them away from each other into the right areas where we can be together, but not be too close to each other. So just a thought, you know, having the coach in the middle, I designed this so that way the coach has a field of view of everyone that's training, you know, walking around and doing things such as, you know, getting right up and get some coaching. That's not really going to be acceptable for us. So we're going to have to kind of, you know, master this. You're going to have to keep that six feet of distance. And if I'm a coach, I will probably want to stay a little bit further away just because we have a tendency to get involved and get into some things there uh, when we see them. So just just a thought on that. Um, you know, each kid should have their own ball. And I would recommend as we start, you know, these kids, they've been doing things at home, but it's different when you get them into an environment with other players. They're going to fatigue pretty easily. So we're going to have to keep these activities, in my opinion, pretty short because they're going to be intense. You know, there's no there's no rest ratio broken into these things. It's going to be work, 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 and then stop. You know, it's either on or you're off. So you're going to have to do some planning a little bit shorter, I think, uh, you know, doing a lot of dribbling activities uh, and uh, and then maybe do some passing activities within their little grids. Um, just just as I was thinking, just to show you guys got an example of, of what I'm thinking here uh, with the grids is that you can go out, map out the grids. And then if you want to do some kind of thing like a cone maze, uh, you know, some kind of dribbling activities that you can set that up. Go ahead and get the players uh, involved, you know, giving them different ideas. You know, if I'm the coach, maybe I set myself up one so I could demonstrate right through the middle. Uh, and then you have them do that activity. And then when we get into, say, you want to do some passing, say if we uh, we can partner one and two together, we can partner three and four together. And maybe, uh, you know, one is checking away from the ball through one of these gates, checking back in to kind of simulate a little bit of movement uh, within there. Or you can uh, do some activities where, you know, they receive the ball, they're taking a touch while the cone, playing the ball back in to, to kind of give them some kind of game-like activities and, and feel. But, you know, this is not going to be <laughs> game-like at all, right? So we're, we're going to have to define some things. Now, my suspicion is that most of these uh, time period for the first phase is going to be mostly for tryouts. So I feel like you can find a lot of stuff within that little uh, setup. Uh, that you need to see to evaluate. You know, you can do a lot of ball striking, you can do things, uh, you know, passing through there, you can do dribbling things, receiving things. Uh, you know, obviously playing is gonna be out. So once again, if you have any questions as we go through, just go ahead and, you know, hit them on the chat. Uh, but, you know, this is kind of our my, my first uh, or our second phase look at, at how things should be set up. We'll get into some more activities into phase three that you may be able to kind of borrow into phase one or phase two. But, um, you know, that's kind of the ideas here. So, you know, right now, Jordan, phase three. Jordan's oh, got a good question, Derek. All okay, passing yeah. on the ground, correct? Yeah. Oh, thank you, uh, Jordan. Yeah. So everything needs to be on the floor. So we want to avoid anything that possibly could have skin to ball contact. Um, you know, try to keep it on the deck if you can. Now, obviously, what's going to happen is the ball is going to pop up here and there. That's going to happen. We got to remind the kids as well, do not pick up someone else's ball you know, with their hands, you know, the, the only thing they should use is their feet to touch a ball. Goalkeepers, you need to work on your foot skills anyway. So they, they could continue working on that because we'll be able to get into some goalkeeper activities in the following phase. And we'll explain a little bit of, of what that looks like. So thank you, Jordan. So when we get into phase three, this is where we can start expanding just a little bit. Uh, we can get into larger groups. However, we have to maintain that 10 to 1 player to coach ratio. Now, I want you to understand that once you assign kids into a group, um, you're going to have to keep them in that group. And, and the reason why that is is for contact tracing. If we have uh, a COVID-19 case that go positive, uh, then that way we can kind of limit that down and we can stay in that group. So if you're going to do tryouts in that first phase, and you're gonna have kids that may or may not be with your group very long, I would suggest you maybe wait two weeks after your tryout phase before you start training, or you're gonna to have to keep those kids within that same group. Um, that's just, that's a precaution, you know, to make sure that, that if we do spread any virus, that it can be 
isolated and we can just affect those certain families. But just please keep that in mind. You know, we can't be switching kids from group to group to group. You know, if you've got one grid that's got nine kids and one group that's got one, you can't move that one over to the nine. That's unfortunately that's that's the deal right now. Um, so you're going to have to be prepared to uh, be able to switch some things up if, if that's the case. So just FYI. Okay, uh, Diego. Uh, yeah, we, we're. I, I think that can, and I'll get into uh, some ideas on uh, what to do with some passing patterns. Uh, the, the issue with passing patterns is you're going to have to make sure there's nobody waiting right in that next grid. But I, I certainly think you can, you, you can make that happen. And we're going to go over some that I, I feel pretty confident that we can pull off in, in phase two. So um, anyway, medium sharing of equipment. Uh, which means, you know, we can do a little bit more in terms of pennies and things like that, but we're going to try to keep that as, as minimal as possible. My suggestion to you guys is to give kids two different color shirts or tell them to show up in one, you know, bring a dark and bring a light. If you have uniforms already, have them wear their uniforms and they can switch back and forth. Uh, we as coaches, let's be real honest about this. We're not very good about washing pennies anyway. Um, so I wouldn't expect your kids to be so good at it either. Um, but, you know, make sure that, you know, we, we don't want to have kids, you know, one kid wearing a yellow penny, throwing it into a pile and then another kid putting that penny right back on. Cause now we're talking, uh, possible, you know, touching with the face and things with that. So we, we got to keep that in mind. Uh, you know, if you want to give the kids pennies, that's fine too, but they, they got to make sure that they're washing them. So, um, that, that might solve a lot of our coaching woes right there. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> You know, with uh, I would recommend for for you coaches. I know I, this is odd. This is what I always do, but I would be the one to pick up your stuff. Usually, I would have kids between each activity pick your cones and things like up like that. But I think the less hands on that stuff is the better. So if you don't mind, there, that would be a good practice to make sure you're dealing with all the equipment uh, whenever possible. Okay, there will be some instances we're gonna have to move some things, uh, but. Uh, you know, we, we can try to do that practice as best we can. Um, you know, we're recommending no contact, but the governor's office said low contact. Uh, so what that tells me is that maybe we can do a couple of zonal games where there might be a brief touch here and there. But I think if we are all, you know, in this for the kids and for our safety, we're going to keep this at no contact. I'm going to show some games that we can play that has – uh, no contact in there that can can simulate the game. Um, and, and we're also going to talk about some activities that you could do, but also you got to be careful because they could teach bad habits if we're, if, if we're not careful with it. Okay. Ty, uh, Ty's brought up a good question here, Derek, that you could probably touch on. Yes. Uh, Ty, yeah. Ty's question is once the kids are assigned to a group, uh, do they have to stay in the same group session to session, week to week? Yes. As of now, that is correct. So you're going to have to be very, very strategic. Now, I've also, because of quarantine rules and things like that, you know, if you have a two-week gap between the last time the kids are together and there, that you know, you could maybe shuffle those kids and redo those groups. So that's something to, to think about as well, okay? Um, but we're going to try to keep that pretty, you know, pretty safe there. Um, but we're going to recommend no contact for now, and, and we've got to be – you know, pretty uh, careful about that. This is when I feel pretty good as a goalkeeper that we can start doing goalkeeper training and, and shots and things like that. Um, you know, if you're a coach and you're working with the goalkeeper, I highly, highly recommend you're wearing goalkeeper gloves during that time. Uh, just that way, you know, you can kind of, you can wash gloves. Believe it or not, coaches, you can wash goalkeeper gloves. I know that's that's a huge, uh, <laughs> huge news flash for some of you and probably for some of your goalkeepers but you can wash gloves in between sessions uh, to do that. So uh, I would recommend that as well, okay? All right, so if there's not any more questions on that so far, I'm just gonna kind of dive in on, on some of the activities that uh, I've either came up with uh, or stolen or you know adapted or whatever. Um, so you know things that I, I think that, you know going back to Diego's question earlier that you can get away with is you know simple Corver, uh, passing patterns, you know, one of the things I, I like to do is have the kids start on the cone and then drop into the space here uh, to receive it and then play it across. So you're kind of getting working on opening up space and things like that. Um, 
you know, whenever you're working with a group of four here, the way this works, if you follow your pass, there's always going to be a cone that's going to be open. So that last person is always going to have to dribble to that cone. Uh, you know, the goal of this thing is to get some movement, but also not to have kids standing within six feet of each other. So that's that's the big key here. You know, if you want to have a another cone somewhere, maybe in the middle, elsewhere, where you know you're not you're you're having a kid start there and coming in to to complete the passing, that's fine. Uh, but just you, you've got to think about all those different angles as, as we go forward. Uh, you know, one thing that I've seen done and I've done a couple of times, if you want to make it a competition between two different groups, um, you, maybe you put a ball in each one of those cones. And if the ball gets knocked off, they got to start again. And first one that gets to five or ten wins. Uh, that way you can start driving a little bit of competition, uh, giving, getting those juices flowing a little bit, you know, just to break up the you know mundaneness of, of sometimes technical training because, you know, the kids kids will probably – Let's be honest, the kids are going to want to play something when they get back. They're going to want some competition because our kids who have been working, you know, have been doing a lot of technical training on their own. They're going to want something a little bit more. So if we can bring some competition, some game type uh, activities, you know, I, I would recommend doing that. Um, you know, here, here's another one uh, that I just adapted and, and same kind of idea is just, just a Corver you know, kind of passing thing where, you know, I've added a fifth one. So that way, you know, you always have that dribble. Um, again, we're going to have to be flexible in what we're planning because if you have one kid that doesn't show up, that's going to change a lot of things. Uh, my, my views on a lot of the stuff I'm doing is I'm not doing 10 person activities. I'm doing two groups of five or two groups of four, a couple of kids rotating in just because we all know as coaches that not everyone's showing up. <laughs> Uh, all the time right so we're gonna have to be adaptable that that way and we're not gonna be able to take and borrow kids from other groups into that group uh so we're gonna have to be uh pretty pretty clever on what we're doing uh but again these are just ideas guys you know you can take them borrow them steal them uh say that that's not gonna work for my group and that's fine uh but you know just th this one's the same kind of concept dropping off the cones you know the the yellow is the player movement so they're just following their passes and we're all staying pretty far away from here. This is a basically just a going around the uh, the clock, just working on swinging the ball. However, you can get really creative in, in a couple of uh, wall passes in here, uh, things like that. I would recommend not doing anything with overlapping runs just because I feel like kids will have a tendency to get a little bit too close uh, at times. And if you freeze it, of course, they're going to freeze right at that moment that they're standing next to each other. Uh, but certainly you can try it if you feel like you can maintain that two yards of distance uh, for sure. All right, uh, and this is uh, you know, a Y pattern. Uh, I'm always a big fan of using Y pattern passing just because uh, if somebody goes the wrong direction, it never breaks down. <laughs> so you can always kind of keep it going. Uh, oh, uh, Fonian's got a question. St competition in phase two and three. The definition of competition for the governor's office is actually scrimmages or matches. Um, so basically what they're saying is no games is what they're saying. Um, especially with outside groups so good question finding you can have you know different ways of having competition in your group obviously without uh playing a game but great question uh but you know on, on the y patterns you know i do a lot of different stuff with this with different wall passes combinations you know this is the basic concept is guy in the middle checks player plays in turns you know using you know his hips make sure the ball staying away from the middle to simulate a defender playing and dribbling in then the next player would come here this player dribble down and then the idea would be to switch sides so that way we can kind of keep everything going uh you can get really complicated with this activity you can also get uh <laughs> very uh very mundane well done parker <laughs> uh yeah just again another passing pattern take as you like uh this is uh one i use a lot to hourglass uh, passing pattern where you have basically two sides going at one time uh, going in opposite directions and going around, you know, switch directions. I do lots of different other movements within this. Now, this is getting pretty big. This is a group of six. So, uh, you know, usually I would have 10 to 12 players in these, these things. So th this could get a little bit, a uh, little bit hectic, you know, if you're not very comfortable doing these kind of things. And, and don't forget, guys, you know, you don't have to worry and, and sketch all this down. I can email you all these activities or send it to you. So 
Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with with all of these. Um, and this is uh, this is one that actually I got from my uh, good friend Tyrone Marshall at Real Salt Lake. Uh, this was actually a passing pattern they did uh, right before they went and played SC Cincinnati last year to walk through. Uh, got the opportunity along with a few other guys to go watch them train uh, before they played. Uh, and just just a little bit different variations. You know, same same type concept though, guys, is everyone is, uh, you know, more than six feet apart. You know, this this one's great because you can use it with five guys or five girls. And, and you know, so you can split your groups in half if you have 10. Uh, but this can get pretty uh, pretty funky and crazy. But you can kind of see the, uh, the concepts and the ideas here. Okay. Um, one of the things I really want to focus on is uh, just kind of game-like type activities. And this one's uh, one that we can use uh, to, to have a little bit of uh, simulation of a game, uh, but also give the kids a little bit of a competition type thing. It's just a simple passing activity where partners are passing the ball back and forth, but you got a player in the middle who's looking to intercept the pass. Uh, and notice that the players have to play through their grid. Uh, and there's two... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, there's uh, two groups per one player in the middle with the grid. So if the uh, player intercepts them, you know, you can rotate that player, uh, pass off and, and get in. Uh, I will say on these type things is that you need to have an idea of how to rotate players. So, for example, if this player, this defender here intercepts this player's pass, maybe I always say the defender has to come out on the outside and through and the player's intercept pass can go straight in. You know, these are things that we're going to have to uh, think about is not just the natural soccer activities, but how do we rotate players in and out? Um, so that way we could still maintain social distancing. Uh, if you have younger kids, I would highly suggest you actually make like almost a cone uh, type area, you know, entrance and exits. Uh, so that way it's visually they can see it. You know, a lot of us like to talk and we like to tell our kids where to go and what to do. But a lot, you know, most of our kids, they do better if they can see it, you know. So, you know, maybe you say, hey, you got to exit through the orange cones, you enter through the blue cones or, you know, whatever, whatever um, equipment that you have that would make sense for those players. OK, um, here's another one. This was just a, uh, you know, this is basically a 4v1 Rondo. Uh, and what each player on the outside has is their own little grid that they can move in and out of. But the rule of the game is they have to play the ball through the defender's grid, which is in this zone. So to get a point, they have to cross the grid. Now, they can play back and forth to a player here to open it up, but I would suggest a rule that the ball always has to continue moving. Uh, and they – or, you know, you could do two-touch rule. Um, but, you know, you can keep track of how many points each group gets and then declare a winner that way. Uh, but, you know, notice that I've got this zone kind of in the middle, so we're not running this guy ragged all the way across the whole grid. So now the players have to set themselves up. So maybe this ball comes here. You know, certainly if this player wants to drop off and create an angle, this ball can get passed diagonally across. And this can give us a little bit of game-like substance. Yeah, uh, John, uh, the question is, uh, are these only for phase three? Yeah, anything that we're getting into kind of game-like activities, I'm suggesting that for phase three. You know, we can get some passing patterns into phase two. Uh, but I think phase two needs to be pretty static and, and needs to be kind of separated uh, from everyone else just to kind of get everybody reacclimated. I mean, ultimately, what we're talking about in, in these phases is almost like, you know, four training sessions if we're going twice a week. Right. So I think we can we can we can sort things out, you know, in, in those two sessions. But uh, you know, this is an idea you guys can do for sure. Um, here's another one. Uh, this one's getting a little bit more complicated, uh, you know, and certainly if you don't have mini goals, you can use cones for that as well. But this is just a three versus one activity rondo where uh, what you what you do is you set up basically an outer boundary where the players on the outside can move into and then inner boundary where the defender can be. Uh, so every pass must be through the defender's uh, boundary. If it's not, you know, the, the player who makes the bad pass has to go in, defender goes out. Um, again, this is another activity that maybe we uh, give defenders. So if the defender wins a pass, if they can immediately play the ball into a, a goal, uh, you give them three points for that. You know, maybe you give you know one point for interception and, and things like that. And then you can kind of incentivize this and just kind of do, do this like in a two minute burst where it can move back and forth quickly uh, and, and get a little bit of competition going uh, for your players during training. 
Um, these, these are just suggestions on the sizes. I didn't put sizes for everything uh, just because I think it's going to be dependent on your uh, player's ability, uh, age, things like that. Uh, I would do suggest that these goals are put back, you know, five yards or, or more, just because if not, you're going to have kids ramming themselves into the goal as they're moving back and forth, and nobody wants to uh, experience that either. Uh, making sure soccer balls are, are plentiful. And again, if, if you're using your own soccer balls for your sessions, you need to make sure they're wiped down, sanitized before the next session, okay? Next activity. Uh, this is another game that you know, I saw and I stole, and I'm not sure who, who came up with this, but this is basically a two versus two activity to, to uh, four goals. Uh, basically, we're going through vertical zones now. So in, in this idea, you've got you know blue having their own blue zone here, blue having a blue zone here. Uh, and I put the goals a little bit behind each zone so that way kids can't just sit right in front of uh, um, front of each, each one. Um, but the idea is that they can play it to their teammates. Defenders are trying to cut off passes, and you know, and players are trying to get opportunities. I did four goals here. You could certainly do two if you like, uh, if you if that's what you want to do. I thought four goals might help, um, you know, the the player from the uh, distance be able to have an opportunity to maybe uh, find a, a deeper pass or deeper shot if if it's on, uh, and just give a little bit of options here. Uh, you could certainly go backwards. You should go forwards. I would also have the rule of either a touch limit or the ball has to keep moving so that way if a player receives it, they either have to look to pass the ball or they have to immediately look to dribble to open up a, a, an opening for them. Um, question from Rich Hood, we need to wipe down the goals also. If there's contact on the goals, particularly the metal pieces, yeah, you're gonna have to. Uh, unfortunately, this is the, the world we're living in. Uh, and I would say particularly if we have a goalkeeper in there because the goalkeeper, uh, we're discussing preachers anyway and we might be breathing on that stuff so you might want to always have that wiped down if possible okay moving on if there's any questions about the activities please please do and these are only ideas uh you know um you know this is another idea that actually came out on my back porch last night uh it, it's just a uh another two versus two game with with lots of goals uh just to kind of get uh the game moving and angles and and, and things like that so the idea is, uh, you know, reds in two diagonal areas, uh, you know, they could score on blue goals. So each each blue player has to defend two goals. So just the idea of just opening up passing angles, open up body shape to be able to, uh, you know, find the, find the right pass. Uh, this way, if you only do one goal here, the problem I foresee is that your kids are going to naturally want to sit right in front of the goal and just kind of block those areas. So now you're forcing them to move a little bit. You got a little bit of competition. Uh, you know, I've got these players on the outside, so this is like with a whole group of 10. Uh, maybe you can add these guys as bumpers if you like, you know, where you have to play into the bumpers before you score. Uh, you know, there, there's all kinds of different options that you could do in this setup. And again, if you don't have a bunch of mini goals, which most of us really don't have this many mini goals, just use, you know, you can use uh, poles, you can use sticks, uh, you can use cones, you know, something just, just to get some ideas. Um, you know, and maybe you have, uh, you know, you could do some goalkeeper stuff as well uh, in, in a setup like this. Um, you know, moving on to uh, the next thing uh, is now we can start talking about, you know, doing some finishing stuff in phase three. Uh, you know, and this is just a group of uh, five players. Uh, my thoughts are the one thing I get a little bit hesitant about when we're talking about finishing and shooting activities is we've got to make sure that the goalkeeper isn't tempted to come out and, and make contact with players. So I don't mind crossing activities and things like that, but you gotta understand if you're putting a striker and a goalkeeper in the same area, the goalkeeper's natural tendency is to come out. Uh, I also don't wanna set up any activities that are gonna promote bad um, habits later on. So I don't wanna you know, have a crossing activity where the ball is getting into the six yard area. And then you're like, well, keepers don't come out for that. Because in a few weeks, you're going to be screaming at your goalkeeper, why didn't you come out and make that collection whenever uh, we're having a game? And it's going to come back to how we trained before, during this. Uh, so, you know, the idea of this one is just having like a little dribbling station. This player looks to shoot uh, and, and on the goalkeeper here, immediately comes up, comes across to hit a one-time ball from this player. Uh, and then she's going to have to come back around the cone to receive a ball from here. 
I'm doing the around the cone thing because now that doesn't get her too close to the goalkeeper. So it's always kind of making sure ball contact is around the uh, between the 18 and the penalty spot uh, and just working on both sides. And then basically, you know, what I would do as a competition is I would keep, you know, points. So you get so many points for each finish uh, and then rotate all the players through and then you have a point winner for that day, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, so this is a, obviously if you have a goalkeeper in your group and with this group of players, you know, if you have a group of 10, uh, you could rotate them around. If you just have one of the goalkeepers in there and the goalkeeper can be back and forth in there as well. So, um, here's another idea I thought, uh, you know, that would be relevant is just basically a three versus two game, uh, with the defender. Uh, somewhere in the middle. Now, this is this is going to be important because you're going to have to really, uh, you know, lay down a zone for that defender where they can move. Because uh, naturally, as defenders, we're going to want to close the space and get pressure on. So that that's one thing that we're going to have to be very careful about as we're playing. Uh, but now we have three attackers here where they can move the ball. The idea is, can they move the ball quick enough through their zones to be able to get a shot? You know, that's uh, without the defender in the way. Uh, the idea here is the defender wins the ball. He's got counter goals to immediately play out. You know, if you look at this situation here, this is almost at a center back winning the ball and they're directly playing into their six or eight uh, to start a counterattack. You know, uh, same thing with the goalkeeper. If the goalkeeper wins the ball, you know, looking to play out, and then you can give points uh, for that type of thing as well. Uh, so ju just an idea. You know, my thoughts are, again, I'm trying to keep in the smaller groups just to um, the, the idea that probably some kids are going to miss, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So. Um, that's pretty much all the stuff that I had um, to, to show you guys. Uh, I've got, I'm sure I've got more stuff somewhere. Uh, are, are there any questions out there that we want to kind of uh, explore and talk about? All right, guys. Well, you know, that, that's, Yeah, will do, Mike. Uh, I'll send out that stuff that has uh, what what uh, what's recommended for phase two and phase three. Um, you know, we got word on the passing thing. I think somewhere around a little bit after eight o'clock last night. Uh, so that's kind of that kind of changed some things in the presentation there for sure. So, uh, but thanks for clarifying that. Um, there we go. Question from. Um, Andrew, you Andrew had a question about 1v1s and 2v2s and where it fits in scrimmaging wise. Yeah, so uh, Andrew, good question. Uh, or I, I'm sorry, uh, Nathan, sorry. Um, Nathan, that's a good question. The, the problem that we have with the one versus one, two versus twos in the first two stages is that you know our directive is that it needs to be low contact, low sharing. I, I, I don't know a world and where you can have low contact, low sharing or medium sharing in a 3v3 situation. So I am assuming that we're going to be able to do those type of activities onto phase four, which, you know, if we're looking at how they've structured the, the calendar here, that's looking likely in, you know, July 13th-ish, you know, assuming everything uh, goes on there. So, um, so just to keep that in mind, okay. Um, Ideas for keeper training when it comes to working on their footwork. Yeah, if you want, uh, if you guys want some things, I can send some stuff. Um, you know, the big thing for goalkeepers, especially during that phase two, is that they really need to work on their first touch, receiving a ball that's not directly in front of them, putting it out a little bit, where it's, you know, about a yard or so away from their body where they can play a quick pass if needed, but also to play the big ball out. You know, a lot of our players have a tendency to have their first touch way too tight to their body so they have to take a second touch to play three um so you know we want to make sure that that, that that distance is there um you know if if you've got a couple of keepers in a group maybe you can pair them together and have their stations a little bit further apart so they're hitting a little bit longer passes to each other uh and, and things like that so um so that's a great idea um susan's um, got a question on u fours um Susan, I would hold on that. Um, th that's a tricky one because I don't think there's a situation right now where four-year-olds could socially distance because you're going to have to have parents and things like that anyway. That might be something that we can give you a little bit more clarification on 
as we find out what phase four is because i feel like if we get to phase four we will we will be able to kind of open that up a little bit more but i certainly wouldn't have u fours out there on phase two or phase three so um question from john will uh phase four allow two coaches uh john we, we really don't know um we, we haven't gotten any kind of briefing from the governor's office yet on what the next stage looks like um i hope so uh but I, I really don't know now just to be clear on phase three you can have several groups out there so if you have you know your group has 20 team you know 20 players on the team 18 players on the team you have another you can have another coach out there at that point um, you just can't have another coach working with two different groups so that that's that's going to be a, a big part of that so um, Jeremy I'm sorry were you saying something there no I was just touching on Susan's question about you four you got to it gotcha okay great all right um, any other questions out there that I can hopefully deal with? Um, you know, if there's some activities that you guys want to run, you know, by me, that's great. You know, I'd love to take a look at them. Um, you know, and I'll certainly, uh, I'll go back and clean up the slide deck and send this out to everybody so they kind of know what phase two and phase three activities are. Um, but if not, you know, that, that's kind of what I got for you guys. If you guys want to hold on, I'll stay on the line for a little bit longer, but um, I appreciate everybody jumping on the call today. Um, I'm excited because soccer is, is slowly returning uh, and, and hopefully we'll be uh, all seeing each other out the field complexes here soon and then we can kind of joke around about uh, this 2020 year at some point and how crazy it's been for us. So thanks everybody. I'm going to stop recording now. So if you guys want to ask questions that you're too chicken to uh, ask during the, during the recording, you can. But otherwise,